Good afternoon. My name is Timothy Hampton. I am the director of the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities at the University of California at Berkeley. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to our event today. Our conversation this afternoon with Joyce Carol Oates was originally scheduled to occur last spring. It was one of the first things that we unfortunately had to cancel with the onset of the pandemic. In fact, I would say that when we had to cancel that event, it was the, for us the moment at which we realized how dramatically disruptive the pandemic was going to be for education. That is why it is especially sweet to be able to pick up that interrupted conversation where we left off and to hold the event today. We are honored and delighted to welcome Joyce Carol Oates back to the Humanities Center, a towering figure in American letters. Joyce Carol Oates enjoys eminence as a novelist, playwright, essayist, and writer of powerful and influential short stories. She is the Roger S. Berlin 52 Professor Emerita in the Humanities at Princeton University and has taught multiple times as a visiting professor in the English department at Berkeley. Here in the Townsend Center, we know her as a regular guest at our events, a generous and gracious interlocutor and conversationalist whose commitment to both writing and teaching are legendary. We thank her in advance for agreeing to talk with us today and we are also indebted to John Shoptaw, poet, critic, and our colleague in the Berkeley English Department, who will be Joyce's conversation partner and moderator of our event today. Toward the end of the hour, there will be some time for a few questions. So if you're interested in joining the conversation, you can use the live chat function on your screen. Let me then welcome you all to this event and express our delight at welcoming Joyce Carol Oates back to Berkeley. Thank you, I wish I were there. <laughs> And be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Wait a month and then, uh, then yes. you wish. Well, I'm very happy to be uh, able to talk with you, even in this mediated uh, form, uh, about your work and your work in a special way with an emphasis on the art of writing. So some questions I'll be asking you uh, will be, you know, pitch to give, I think the, the audience a bit of a glim glimpse of the other side of the page, not only the reader side, but the writer's side of the page. Um, so I, I want to start where uh, we are now with your 2020 novel, I'll hold it up. Uh, Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars. Um, a very singular title, uh, four periods. I've never seen a title with that many periods. Um, and I thought, uh, Joyce, maybe you could uh, begin by telling us about this uh, title. Well, the title, of course, is taken from the a very beautiful poem by Walt Whitman. It's actually my favorite poem. And I think, I think it comes back to me now that at the Poetry Hour at Berkeley, that's the poem that I might, that I might have written. I think Bob mm -hmm. is celebrating uh, just people reading poetry. Mm -hmm. that's what I read. It's a very short poem and it introduces us to a Whitman who's not so, um, extroverted, so gregarious, so public, so macho, but rather an interior, more spiritual and introspective Walt Whitman. We see him walking alone at night and looking up at the sky and alone with his soul. Do you have your book with you, Joyce? I don't have it right now. I'm so sorry, I don't actually have it. I mean, it's upstairs. Okay. Um I'll read the poem. Good. Always happy to play Walt Whitman. Uh, it's a late poem, uh, 1881, uh, long after a uh, song of myself, when he, yes, uh, went, turned from the body to the soul, a clear midnight. This is thy hour, O soul, thy free flight into the wordless, away from books, away from art, the day erased, the lesson learned. Thee fully forth emerging, silent, 
gazing, pondering the themes thou lovest best, night, sleep, death, and the stars. Um, so beautiful. It's, it's quite, quite wonderful. You know, it, it made me uh, think that you could have gone with those uh, four last words for your sections. Uh, and I, I could tell perhaps you did in that your fourth section is the stars. I don't know if you remember whether you considered that or mainly considered it avoiding it. Why did you not do it? Well, I don't really remember. The, the novel evolved. Mm -hmm. So many works that are long sort of evolve over a period of months. And if you're working on something for a long time, it keeps changing. You, I always have a sense of the structure, sort of the architecture of a novel, but when I actually get in the novel, it often gets much longer. And so um, sections that would seem to be a certain length sometimes are longer. I think that I, I probably couldn't anticipate that. I knew what the final paragraph would be and I knew what the final chapter would be, but I didn't always know how I would get to the ending. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, not being a, a novelist, that, that is more or less as I expected. I, I need to have some sense of where I'm going. It very much makes sense that you set out in a direction and that's part of what novel writing must be, setting out in a direction. Um, the beginning of the first chapter the, in uh, the vigil in your first section, section one, chapter one, is called Wind Chimes. Uh, that title comes up again at the end of your fourth chapter, and I know there's a fifth, I mean, a fourth section, I know there's a fifth section. Uh, so the, it, you're framing uh, with wind chimes and it's a very important um, moment. I, uh, since you don't have your book with you, I, I'm gonna take the liberty of reading a bit from this so uh, people can just hear the beauty of the, uh, of the prose, especially yeah, uh, wind chimes, a light chill rain, but she doesn't want to come inside just yet. Gust of wind, a sound of wind chimes, so happy that the faint fading sound of the wind chimes hanging from several trees at the rear of the house. Is it selfish, she wonders, to be so happy? She has been carefully pouring seed into bird feeders that hang from a wire above the deck, corn, sunflower seeds. In nearby trees, the birds are waiting, chickadees, titmice, sparrows. It is such a small task, and yet it is crucial to her to execute it correctly. Realizing then that she has been hearing from inside the house, a ringing phone. What wonderful to start with the wind chime and well, thank you. close with a, a ringing phone. Uh, it's such an immediate and intimate way of writing, almost environmental in the sense that you have a character, not even named, uh, you don't even have that much mediation at this point. Uh, but a style in which that character can thrive. Um, and yet it begins in the third person. And that is again, a, a, the way not taken, uh, one way not taken would have been to have a narrator in the first person or have the parents and the, the children narrate. Uh, why, whether you remember making that decision, why do you like uh, what the way you do it? Well, I should say when you were reading that, I could almost hear the wind chimes here. Oh, yeah. The novel is actually set in my own house, and I'm I'm in I'm in a room in the in the house, oh, and out on the back deck are are wind chimes and 
and who were bird feeders. When my husband was alive, he was particularly interested in feeding the birds. So in the novel, the the widow is carrying on some of the the rituals and customs yeah. that she she and her husband had together. But the husband the husband is not going to be with her. He's, he's been very seriously injured at that point. She doesn't know that yet. Yeah. So it's really a novel about grief and and the ways that we come to grips with grief. I didn't want to write in the first person because I wanted there to be some distance. It's not just the widow who's grieving for her lost husband, but his children as mm -hmm. well. So it's like a, a chorus of voices. Yeah. It certainly, it, it does not give them the leverage of retrospection that a narration would have given them. So I think that puts them, it gives them immediacy and not, you know, the power of perspective over their own story. So it's, it, you know, it's, for me, it's, a, it's an excellent choice uh, for this novel. In another novel, you may make another kind of choice as you, as you do. Um, so you have uh, five sections, and then before the first section, you have this prologue, which you were hinting at. Um, we know if you read, one might suspect that the phone call is going to be connected with something that happens. Um, and as I was thinking, I wondered, you know, why not leave out the prologue and just let the mystery unfold at, as it would? Did, with, with, why, why, uh, why did you feel the need in your structure for for, for having a, a prologue from the father's uh, point of view. Well, John, you're asking sort of a, an unusual question because I could have left out a lot of things. Yes, no, I know. I could have left out what children. I could have left out several children. I, I wanted to write the prologue. To me, that begins the novel. We yeah. see it's almost cinematic and we see, we see from a little distance something that's happening and then we see all the consequences that follow from the prologue. If I were to begin with the with uh, the first chapter rather than the prologue, we would never we would never see what actually happened. Mm -hmm. We would never see it. Yeah. No, that's right. Well, it's uh, you know there are uh, crime novels where often the detection of a crime is somehow connected with a trauma. And uh, it's certainly for one of the children, uh, Tom, uh, that, that seems to be the case. And for him, it's part of the work of mourning. It seems to be involved with solving the crime and finding justice, um, however he, he, he can. Um, and I, I think that maybe had you not had the prologue, that kind of story would have taken over, but that's only one child story. This is this is bigger than that. So I felt in a way you kind of precluded that from happening. We see everything. You give us the solution <laughs> in the prologue. You we see we see the disparity between what people think happened and what actually happened. Yeah, yeah. We have some measure of objectivity. It's like a camera has been recording what happened. Where a man of about, he's about in his 60s, he had been once been a mayor of a city. He was what was known at the time as a moderate Republican. I think they don't exist at any longer. <laughs> but a very decent, good hearted, generous man who is no longer in public service. He's not a politician now, he's, he's retired into private life. He's driving home and he sees what appears to be two police officers behaving very, very brutally with someone whom they've stopped. It looks like a black man or a person of color and they're harassing him and actually beating him. So the, my character feels as a white man, he's taken, he's just completely assimilated his, his privilege. He feels that he can stop his car 
and go over and question those police officers and make them stop doing what they're doing, which looks like, uh, it looks like brutality. And because he completely misreads the situation, he precipitates what's a personal tragedy and tra tragedy for his family. So the reader needs to see how he gets into that situation and how he misjudges it. And then the reader needs to know how the police officers are lying. They're totally lying about what happens. And Tom McLaren, who's the son, he does behave a bit like a detective. He makes his way sort of uh, gropingly and intuitively, but we, the reader, really knows what has happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's wonderful that we know in advance. It's often not the case uh, in detective stories. So that's what, for me, that was my question, why uh, you did that. And I, I, I feel I have a, a, a understanding of it. I wasn't writing the I wasn't writing a detective. Novel. That's right. That's right. That's right. I feel if you'd left it out, that would have prompted a different kind of, of narrative, which this is not what this novel is about. Well, I'm very interested in genre. Yeah. The, yeah. the thriller genre is different from the mystery genre, the crime novel, the police procedural novel, and mm -hmm. what we call the literary or mainstream novel. They're mm -hmm. all and genres and they have different uh, methods and different strategies. Yeah. So um, let me turn to a section, uh, uh, the third section or the third part, uh, which has this curious uh, title, uh, namely untitled colon, the widow. Um, I don't know if you would be happy or willing at this point for new readers to explain why not just call it the widow. It's based on a photograph in the novel, um, a very um, charismatic, initially somewhat mysterious person is a photographer. He takes a photograph of the woman who had been listening to the wind chimes, who is the, the widow in the novel. He takes a photograph of her at the graveside of her, of her husband. She's in the cemetery and he sort of comes up behind her and takes this photograph and she doesn't turn around. She doesn't really know he's taken the photograph. And when he, he displays the photograph in an exhibit, it's called Untitled because he doesn't know who she is. And basically it's a vision of the widow in a universal or archetypal sense, like the widow rather than an individual. So that's why it's called Untitled, The Widow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It's um, the first chapter in this section is uh, called Mac the Knife. Uh, the last chapter in this section is called Dear Hugo, uh, the first name of the photographer. So you have this wonderful framing starting with whatever it is, Mac the Knife, which you will tell us. And then in the middle, well, I'll just say, it's a tomcat uh, known as Mac or Mackie. Uh, the last name of the family name, by the way, is McLaren. So uh, that, that helps. Uh, and in the middle, that same Tom, uh, who has more aggression than he seems to know what to do with, partly out of frustration at reaching an impasse in his detective uh, search, uh, tries to kill the cat in the middle. Uh, so, um, so my question here about this section, and it's a kind of continuing question for you, is the question of animals. Um, there's something about your work, Joyce, that uh, I, I love in that you feel that the, the description of human life uh, would be incomplete without animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering what you think about that in general, what you think about your cat, uh, your character cat in this story. Well, that's such, a good, that's such a good question, such a good issue. I feel so nostalgic and kind of sad because I read the section Mac, Mac the Knife at 
at Berkeley at the Story Hour. So oh. that, that's a wonderful memory. Yeah. Well, Mac the Knife in the novel is a creature who comes out of the out of the woods. He's a fair a feral tomcat who's had a lot of adventures. He's missing one eye, and his ears are all torn, and he's scarred. But he's a very feisty tomcat, and he uh, he really enjoys being a carnivore. <laughs> so he's a kind of image of a natural creature who survived a good deal. He comes to the back door and the widow lets him in and she feeds him, even though her children think that he might have rabies, he might have different cat illnesses and they, they really don't approve of her having this rough cat. And sometimes he scratches her as a tomcat might do. And Tom thinks he wants to protect his mother. So he thought he would like to kill the cat. As it turns out, I won't tell what happens. He does kill something. But, you know, cats have nine lives. So Mac just comes in and next time Tom is there, the cat just comes in. So he, he didn't succeed in that. But when you, you just brought up an, such an interesting subject because I'm not so much enjoying something I'm writing right now. I'm working on a novel. And I think the reason is that there's no animal in it. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to have to go back and put an animal in this novel to give me a little bit, to lift my heart a little more. Yeah. I'm, I'm missing it. I love that. Well, what you do with an animal like Mackie is like no other novelist I've ever seen. What I'm used to in narratives, whether they're films or, or otherwise, is that a an animal will become a familiar for one of the characters. That is, they express something about their personality, uh, something like that. The golden compass kind of formalized or mythologized that, that whole re relation. But it's not at all that simple with Mackie the Knife. Mackie the Knife is not the widow. <laughs> Mackie is someone who comes in to the widow's bed and the, the widow uh, you know, befriends the cat. Uh, and then uh, Tom uh, has a relation, Tom, T-H-O-M, you don't call him Thomas. Uh, there's Tom versus Tom. Uh, and then uh, this wonderful uh, photographer uh, with the mustache, with some fur on his face, just like uh, uh, Mackie and his whiskers. Uh, and all the children are just as distrustful of Hugo this strange man as they are of uh, Mackie. So, uh, so I love that. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah. Well, women are, I just don't want to sound sexist, but I think <laughs> women and girls are extremely attracted to men who like animals. There's something about a man holding a hmm. cat or a dog or, you know, whatever. It's, there's some element tenderness and protectiveness sort of align with the the body you know the physical self the sensuous self but also something very tender and uh, emotional so Hugo is very friendly to Mackie and Mackie and Hugo are kind of like you know soulmates let's say or brothers mm -hmm. uh, they represent a certain philosophy and passion but also a kind of tenderness. So Mackie does purr. He has a kind of strange crackling sound that he makes. But I have to tell you one more thing, and please don't laugh at me. This sounds a little silly, and maybe people won't believe it, but after I finished the novel, just a few, a few weeks, out of the woods behind our house came a black cat, a feral cat, who came into our life. Uh, he made his way through the cat door. It's one of those doors our cats can go in and out. So one day I came in the kitchen downstairs and here is this beautiful black cat. Not like Mackie though, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't really a, a nasty time cat. He was more of a sweet, a sweet kitty. And we, we thought this was a female cat and we named him Sheba. And so this cat came into our lives and stayed for about two years. And then I'm afraid he went away again, but it so replicated my novel 
people might think, well, I was basing my novel on the cat that came out of the woods, but it wasn't that way. It was the other way around that life was imitating art. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's amazing. It really is amazing. Um, so the novel might have ended uh, with section four um, <laughs> and with familiar terrain. Uh, but then you did something totally surprising. Talk about surprise endings. Uh, you moved to another section uh, called Galapagos. Uh, and, you know, my obvious question would be, why a final section on Galapagos where none of the family members or Hugo, not to mention Mackie, have ever been? Well, Hugo is a world traveler, and he would certainly have wanted to go to Galapagos. Uh, yeah. Well, I have to say that much of the novel is autobiographical, and you know my late husband, Charlie Gross. Now, Charlie was a world traveler, and we went to the Galapagos together. Mm -hmm. Some of the, uh, a lot of the um, repertorial element of the novel set in, in the Galapagos is very much from my journal. The way, <clears throat> the way, Jessalyn, who is very much like myself, is looking at the iguanas and the, the various birds, the seabirds, the uh, look of the land in the Galapagos. Much of her thinking is my own, my own thinking. And then Charlie, my husband, was a model for Hugo. Hugo in being somewhat brash and kind of macho, mm -hmm. striding ahead and going up the mountain, turning his ankle, you know, hurt because he's pushing himself so. Mm -hmm. So the, no the novel could not possibly end without going to the Galapagos. The widow had never traveled anywhere and her children kept saying, oh, M mom doesn't want to go anywhere. She's so happy at home and she would never have gone by herself. But, the but her new husband, the new man in her life, he takes her there. So it ends, it ends with them being in a very different place. So she's been sort of wrenched out of the the house in which we find her, in the house in which I'm living, actually. She's been taken out of that and she's in a completely different place. And we don't, she doesn't really know whether she'll come home. You know, it's, she's taken a great risk. Mm -hmm. And I have such strong feelings about how we need to take risks and how there may be times in our life, our lives when we just don't feel we have the strength anymore to take another risk. At her point in her life, she did feel that she could take a risk. Well, I, it was certainly a, a risk uh, taking uh, maneuver to write and end a family novel on Galapagos. And I, I feel be, even beyond just being, you know, not home, you know, it, this is Darwin's uh, island and it does usher in this whole perspective where so, you know, incredibly, the novel picks a perspective that is not anthropocentric. No, I'm afraid not. That's the vision you get in the Galapagos. Have you been there, John? I have not. Yeah, you should probably go. You should probably go there. Uh, you, you, it's a, it's a, it's a visionary experience. Whether you like it or not, it's absolutely profoundly existential, and every everything. I mean, like politics. Um, history, everything starts to look pretty much uh, reduced in scale from the perspective of the Galapagos. Mm. It's all about survival and it's about becoming extinct. Mm -hmm. And that's the drama. Jessalyn was stuck, well, she was sort of stuck in her upper middle class world. But when she's in the Galapagos, she, she looks around and she sees a very different world. That's the world that we're kind of afraid of you know, night, sleep, death, the stars. We're sort of huddled together in our, our civilization, like around a, a, a campfire, and we need our language and our words and our, our poetry and our books. But out there in the Galapagos and out there in the stars, there's, there's no language, you know? We've gone beyond what we can control or even imagine we can control. That's where I felt Whitman came in that you moved into the wordless. Into the wordless, which is very hard for people like us 
John, you are a master of many poetic forms. You love to work with po poetic forms and, and do unusual things in an experimental way. And I'm a little bit like that, though, not like you. I mean, you, you can really do remarkable things with, with language. And so it's like, we're like people who've learned to play a certain kind of very intricate music with our fingers, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we get to some place where there's no piano, and there's no music, and there's no language. And I think it's, uh, it's instructive for us to come back from those places and try to express it. But it's actually pretty terrifying. Yes, that comes through. That comes through as sublime uh, in that it's also terrifying. Uh, and, you know, part of the kind of campfire that humanity, many humans have gathered themselves around is the humanity of, you know, humans have this special creation and then the human soul is immortal. And that's only human souls have souls and, and that is immortal. And uh, I think, you know, so much of human life uh, as most people know it, who don't take up a Darwinian perspective has this kind of quality of belief. And, you know, one, say one the edge of belief is apostasy uh, or betrayal. And I'm, now transitioning to the novel before this one, the 2019 novel, My Life as a Rat. Um, and I wonder first if, just so everyone is familiar with, I think a term that's maybe not so common as it used to be in J Jimmy Cagney's day, uh, rat. But what, what is a rat, Joyce? Well, the colloquial, the, the colloquial definition of, of a rat would be someone who, who snitches, someone who informs on someone else. And it, as pointed out in the novel by, by the protagonist's math teacher, that ra rats are probably less likely to snitch on one another than human beings. You know, human beings have sort of taken images of animals and use them in their own way to express human traits. But probably the rat is a very, a perfectly uh, natural creature and, and no more likely to inform on one another than human beings. Yeah, the, uh, and Violet Rue Kerrigan is the rat in this novel. Uh, there is a, a crime that is uh, kept, meant to be kept within the family and then within at least the white community. Um, and she unintentionally uh, rats on her, uh, her brothers. Um, how, do you remember how old she was, roughly how old Violet was? 11. 11, yeah. So, What's curious, if to go back to your title, which is the kind of brilliance of, of your title, is my life as a rat. Not like I once was a rat or my life after being a rat. Yeah. So it's as though her whole, it's as though after being exiled, she, she still embodies this, this belief system. Oh. Yes, the novel is about her life as a rat. I'm, under the spell of her family, yeah. and she's no longer. She sort of liberates herself. Where her father has died, he was the, he was the main person who had expelled her. Yeah. He disowned her, and then her mother is serious, is ill with dementia, and her brother has become fallen in, and her other brother's dead. So at the by the end of the novel, she actually is liberated. So we don't know what her life after the post life after she's a rat, we can tell that she's moving toward a new chapter in her life. She has someone whom she loves, who seems to love her and respect her and understand her. So he's sort of at the end of the novel. He's like, if there were another chapter, she's going to this other man, but yeah. her life as a rat is over and she's not, gonna, she's not a rat anymore. Yes, it's a wonderful moment. I feel that's the psychological climax. Uh, we have a revelation by one of the brothers um, and uh, a realization by Violet. And 
curiously and almost ironically, that chapter is called Forgiveness. Um, the novel as a whole is narrated in this retrospective or testifying first person past tense. You know, she's giving her, her telling her story. Uh, this chapter goes back to something like the beginning of uh, Night Sleep, Death, the Stars, but it's in the second person, present tense. And it's a wonderfully intimate way of telling a story, much more so than I. Yes. And I, uh, uh, I so much enjoyed that. Uh, but I, I wonder why did you, at that moment of, you know, revelation of the pure evil of her brother uh, and recognition on her part, what was it about the second person, you know, present that really worked, worked for you? Well, I think that was the very beginning of the novel for me when I began writing it and writing about it and writing, you know, taking down notes and writing sketches and dialogue. It was from the first, it was from the second person because I felt a, a great identification and intimacy. One of the great fears of children, which we probably always have through our lives is that we will be expelled from our families. Yeah. We have to disown. We have to be the child our parents wanted. Mm -hmm. And if we diverge from that and we veer in one direction, suddenly they don't love us quite the way they used to. Mm -hmm. some, of, some of us realize, oh, that's what it is. I'm a child of these parents, but only as long as I am their child. If I start to have a different thought or a different allegiance, or if my ethical development is a little different from theirs, they're not gonna love me. So mo most of us veer right back in the middle and we do anything that we can to keep that love. Now, Violet probably would have been like that, but she's so traumatized and she's actually beaten up by her brother. She's, um, she's not well, she's in school, she starts crying, she has a small breakdown. So when her teacher says, Violet, what's wrong? She just starts crying and she's only 11 and she just tells how her brother seems to be threatening her. And she goes on and she says a lot that she can never retract. And from that point onward, she's a ward of the, of the county. She's in a foster home. She's taken out of her parents' home because she's, con she's considered her at risk mm -hmm. because the family has been harbor harboring two murderers and, and she doesn't feel safe. And so she never goes back home. Mm -hmm. so, by, by speaking very openly what was in her heart, inadvertently, she's destroying her, her connection with the family. I'm very interested in where our loyalty to the family leaves off and our loyalty to something larger, like uh, an uh, ethical belief system of morality. Yeah. We're living in a time right now in the United States when there's so much open corruption and, and criminal behavior really very, very explicit. And the highest uh, value that our President Trump wants from people is loyalty, which is like, you know, a mob, a mob boss wants loyalty. You have, right. to, you have to kiss the ring. So I, I always have been fascinated by people who dare to go against their own families if they see that their family is behaving in an unethical or immoral way. Yeah. I, I feel in this book, you have two competing senses of the truth. What is the truth? One, one, oh yes, hi. Hi Lilith. <laughs> <laughs> this hi, Lilith. Yeah, she's not uh, <laughs> um, one, one model of the truth is the factual. You know, what happened, where's the evidence, like the bat that was used. And I'll say that this was a racially motivated murder uh, by, by the brothers, a, a young black man was, was killed. 
um, it reminded me in life imitating art of the of the fellow that was uh, jogging. Yes. So, uh, but yes. the other model, competing model of proof that you bring up here, Joyce, is true, being true to someone, true to your family, or untrue. You know, we call it sometimes you say a realist description. It was very faithful. You know. Uh, that uh, but someone a rat is unfaithful they are untrue and this is the sense in which I see your book this book being so timely not just the racial crime but this meditation on belief system yeah. meditation on the belief system uh, people cannot see uh, what's happening and that's what Violet says at the end of that chapter called forgiveness where, you know, we're expecting the narrative of she goes back home and, you know, they all is forgiven. <laughs> we don't get that. Uh, but she says, what a fool I was. I was blind. And I look out today and I think there's climate change. You can't see this. It's 120 in LA. It's yeah. LA. Uh, but there is this, your sense of truth and being true to your clan true to your party, true to your... Yeah, the true to your tribe, yes. People are hypnotized by what they're told. I was also interested in the story of the Unabomber because as you probably remember, it was the Unabomber's brother who recognized the Unabomber's writing. It was published in some newspapers. Mm -hmm. He contacted the FBI and he said, you know, I think I know who the, who the Unabomber is. Yes. And that yes. Be and That's interesting. He didn't do that in any glib way. I mean, it was a an act of conscience. You know, it wasn't anything that was done easily or flippantly or glibly. It was something that was difficult. Yeah. And all the rest of your life, okay. after that, you have to remember that you were the one who informed on your own family member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He made a deal with the FBI that his brother would not be executed. Uh, he sort of negotiated that he would have a life in, life in prison, I think, something like that. Yeah. But nonetheless, some people thought that the Unabomber's brother was a rat. And I thought that was so unconscionable and so unacceptable. He was somebody who was rising above the family, uh, you know, the confines of the family okay. and with an allegiance and responsibility to something larger, to society. Yeah. Well, that's a term that only makes sense within the belief system. You, you can't have a rat outside of that system, so. Oh. Well, Henry David Thoreau spoke about some of these issues. Of the, well, the abolitionists and John Brown, of course, were dramatizing this, um, you know, this paradox where you're breaking the law of the United States of America at a certain time yeah. if you help a black slave escape, you were committing a felony and you could be um, put in, in prison. Yeah. Nonetheless, many people, many, many people thought they had a higher loyalty, a higher belief system, and that you should be helping black slaves escape from their, you know, you know their man and uh, move them along the underground rail railway up into Ontario, Ontario, Canada. That was actually a very good thing to do, but at the same time, it was a criminal act mm -hmm. in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask uh, uh, about another novel moving back in time of few years. Uh, the Man Without a Shadow, which in some ways is the most experimental of the books that I'm uh, mentioning here. It's, I mean, they're all, they're all experimental in that they always surprise me. Um, they're deeply unconventional. So, uh, uh, but this one, uh, especially so, if, if Joyce, if, if you could give us the, the scientific background of to this novel? Well, as I had mentioned before, my late husband was Charlie, was Charlie Gross. He was a noted neuroscientist. And I'm actually in his study right now, surrounded by the complete works of Darwin and 
histories of neuroscience and history of, of science, biology, and all these wonderful books. But among, among the books that I did in his library, uh, books about H.M., who is the most famous amnesiac in the history of neuroscience. H.M. Uh, died not that long ago, actually. Hmm. And he was, um, he had suffered um, irrevocable damage to his brain. I think the amygdala part of his brain uh, when he had epilepsy and a surgeon corrected the uh, epilepsy and reduced the likelihood of his having convulsions. So something went wrong and his memory was destroyed. His short-term memory was gone. He had a short-term memory of about, I think it was 70 seconds. That's right. And then, but his long-term memory was there. So he was about 18 when this disaster happened. Mm -hmm. In my novel, the character is a 30. He has a longer life of, of long-term memory and his short-term memory is approximately 70 seconds. So everything in my novel, all the science, all the experiments about, the, about memory loss, all, everything about it was vetted by my husband, not once, but twice. And so, and all the experiments are either real experiments that happen or experiments that might have, uh, the, that would have been created. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had more fun. It was so exciting. I came to see that scientists who are, who are experimental researchers are really creating novels. They, they have propositions, they have premises. They're, they're setting out on a, on a little journey. They're experimenting with certain things, you know, in their lab. It's a controlled environment, like a novel. And then they're going to have some consequences. And in a, I think in a good experiment, maybe they have some idea what the consequences would be, will be. But in a, a perfect experiment, they don't know. They are going to have answers to questions maybe they haven't even asked. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a great research scientist come upon, they stumble upon answers to questions that weren't asked yet. So I did a lot of reading and research into the history of amnesia and the uh, amnesiac brain. And of course, we're living in an America now where people are getting older, they're living longer and longer and getting older. And as you get older, your short-term memory does start to atrophy. The long-term memory may always be there. You may always remember your first bedroom, you know, when you were a child, but it's likely you'll start to forget, forget what you had for dinner last night. Or people see television or they see a movie and they can't remember what they saw. It's not that they have Alzheimer's, it's just part of the short-term memory starts to, uh, it gets less effective. So one, you know, the story is extraordinary and I can see why it would fascinate you. It certainly did me, but, you know, as someone who, who's never written a novel, I immediately would have said, no, no, you can't do that uh, because, uh, I mean, the, the, it, your character, Eli Hoops, says, can there be a character, can there be a person without a shadow, like a person without a memory, he says, helping us gloss the title. I am, maybe I am that person. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, partly my question would be two problems, immediate challenges with this topic. One is plot. <laughs> you, it, it's in the present tense and you think it's just going to be constant repetition. Where is the plot development? You know, are we in some kind of absurdist Beckett play that goes, or, you know, Steinian continuous present in which nothing happens, nothing develops? Um, that's one, one kind of question. The other is this person, this subject or object is so out there, so seemingly unlike us, how as a character can you engage with the reader, having that person as a character? Well, the novel is really about the, the protagonist of the novel is, is not Eli Hoops. It's, right. it's, it's the woman who's the neuroscientist who's, who's um, 
she literally, she literally in every way falls in love with him. She has fallen in love with the most perfect research subject. <laughs> it's a field that not many people have written about. He's a real person. She can experiment with him week after week after week. She devises these fantastically, to me, interesting experiments oh. having to do with memory. Like one of the most interesting ones, I'm not sure if I made this up or whether it actually I probably did take place, but I think I made it up also. If you remember, if you have a day, uh, injury to your brain and you, you can't remember anything from today onward, nonetheless, you will remember everything up to this point. But what happens to you tomorrow and the day after that, you're meeting new people, but you don't, you won't remember them. Mm -hmm. So every time you meet that new person, it's the first time. But if you're somebody from your old life, of course you know that person. So one of the experiments is showing the, 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 the amnesiac patient is shown photographs of people from the past. You know, President Eisenhower or Stalin or Marilyn Brando or Marilyn Monroe. And he recognizes all these people very, you know, immediately, of course, he knows them immediately. But then the pictures start to become completely unknown to him because they're now, these are people who became famous after his injury. Mm -hmm. So now, even though everybody else knows these pictures, let's say Obama, yeah. does he doesn't know who that is. And he doesn't, he doesn't know what day it is right now. He can tell you what was going on at a certain time way in the past. And he can, he can recite poetry he learned in high school and college. Yeah. And he knows a whole lot of things. Right. But at a certain point in his life, it's a blank. He always thinks... 31 years old, but the novel goes much, you know, he's way beyond that. He's in his 50s, I think. So when an amnesiac looks in the mirror, we wonder, because we don't really know what he's seeing. Mm -hmm. He seems to be seeing evidently his old self, because he still feels he's 31, even though he's now 55. Yeah. And all around him, people are, are looking older. And they're getting older, but he's always the same age. Yeah. I found that exploration into the human mind and memory utterly fascinating. And as I said a few minutes ago, everyone's getting older and they're living longer. So we have to learn to love people even as they start to forget us. Yeah. If, you're, if you love someone, say in a marriage, you may lose that person eventually to memory, memory loss. Mm -hmm. The person may be drifting away from you, but like my character in my novel, you can continue to love them because you're loving something in them that's not tied in with time. Mm -hmm. It's the timeless self that you're loving rather than the time, time bound self. Yeah, I feel that that, that in a way perfectly describes the evolving relationship between Eli Hoops and uh, Margot Sharp. She may have been a novelist scientist at the beginning, but when she falls in love with him and acts on that, she becomes a character with him uh, in their love story. And at one point you say in the book, so long they have floated in the present tense, yeah. so long each has floated without a shadow. Yeah. Well, it was, some of this is based on the work of Suzanne Corcoran. Yes. She was a neuroscientist at, NY, at uh, MIT. Mm -hmm. so she got to know HM after his injury, of course. And each time, she, maybe for 30 years, I think she was experimenting and working with him. Each morning when she came to see him, he had no idea who she was. Mm -hmm. But I felt that she had a strong feeling for him. My novel is not, uh, it's not a biographical novel, it's fiction. I don't think she actually fell in love with him. She probably, she probably didn't. But in my novel, the neuroscientist does fall in love with her subject, the way we all fall in love with our subjects, you know, we're writers. That's right, that's right. We fall in love, you know. 
And then at the end, she has, she has to give him up. You know, he's probably not going to live. She's going to go on. And we learn in the beginning, the novel flashes forward. She's going to be analyzing his brain. She's going to be studying slices of his brain, uh, which is the most horrible thought. I mean, for if you love somebody, the thought of, you know, an autopsy and, and studying the brain, except if you're a research scientist, that's what you're going to do because that's the higher, you know, that's beyond the person. Well, there is uh, uh, one reason why I make the transition between uh, this book, uh, uh, The Man Without a Shadow, and this book, uh, a memoir of yours, uh, The Lost Landscape, uh, because what is not lost are the very vivid early memories uh, that are recorded here. After a certain point, we don't know. <laughs> we, we don't know what's there, what's coming. So again, it, there's, there's a very lifelike quality to the man without a shadow. And I wanted to ask again, in terms of your artistic choices about one wonderful, wonderful uh, early uh, chapter in this uh, memoir, it's called Happy Chicken. Happy Chicken, 1942 to 1944. And I'm gonna read the beginning of it. Uh, I was her happy chick, no, I was her pet chicken. I was happy chicken. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, you know, the immediate question would be, why not do it in the more normal way? It was my pet chicken. I called it Happy Chicken. Why did you make the chicken the narrator of this episode of all the things to do? I just have to laugh, laugh John, because I've never had an interviewer ask me so many questions that are not answerable. Like, you know, why did you do what you did, John? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, why did you call your, your what time speech or whatever? Why didn't you call it something else? And why, <laughs> but we'll leave that for another conversation. Well, obviously I write about the little girl and her mother and father and grandmother. I wanted to have a little bit of a, like a, a cinematic look at them, which I couldn't do if I was writing it myself. Yeah. It, the, the pet chicken was a real chicken, happy chicken. I had oddly thought that Happy Chicken was a was a was a male, but Happy Chicken was obviously a hen. So everything was kind of, you know, when you're a child, things are weird. I could have written about a pet cat. I had many kittens and many cats who are my pets, but only one happy chicken. And I remember this chicken. I I should say that I was in charge of the chickens. Now, John, you grew up in a family and a background a little bit like my own in, in yeah. Missouri. Were you on a farm? I was near a farm and my first uh, work when I was in, in grade school was farm work. So I did do farm work pretty early on. You did a lot of work like that. Well, I, I was in charge of the hen house. You were in and charge of the hen house, okay. Eating yeah. the chickens yeah. and yeah. gathering the pigs. Yeah. So, the first thing, if you are if you're a farm child and you're always working, every everybody in the family has chores. Yeah, you know, children getting an allowance for not doing anything is totally crazy. Like nobody would understand that. And in, in the rural America, we all worked, and so a happy chicken is telling the story. Then I'm also able to leap ahead in time, and um, I can almost not read that without starting to cry because. The ending of it is so, it's so devastating. You know, mem memoirs are so hard to write because yeah. as soon as you get a little older, people in your memoirs are no longer alive. And you look at them and you think, oh my God, I can't believe I've outlived my parents. You know, I love them so much. Yeah. And my grandfather's been dead 50 years. How is that possible? Well, it was great not to have the retrospective look back to cast the adult eye over this. And instead you give us, you know, what Blake called a song of innocence. You know, it's a story of innocence. And I love 
your choice of narrator. We have a couple of questions, which I'm going to read. Uh, one question is, Fantas oh, Fantasy Realm Productions asks, colon, when referring to the prologue, you gave a thorough description of your character. My question is, uh, how deep do you plan out your characters before you begin writing and how much arises along the way? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I didn't really talk about this. Uh... Before I start writing, I do a lot of thinking. I like to go running and walking. There's a hill here, a Bayberry Hill, which is near my house. It's about a mile away. And so I run up Bayberry Hill and back. And almost every day when I run up there and come back, almost every day I have a new idea. <laughs> I think of the place, the place where the ideas are is somewhere spatially, not in the house. It's somewhere that I have to go to. So people ask me where I get my ideas from. It's really that I go to the ideas rather than they come to me. Mm -hmm. Running and, and walking fast takes me out of my own, my own head, actually. And I'm going to some place and I'm thinking about the characters. They're, they more or less are completely, they, they arrive pretty complete to me. I know what they're like and I know what they look like. And I, I sort of know them from the inside. So when, when they start talking, they say things that are characteristic of them. Mm -hmm. Characters in my novels speak from their own personalities. Um, a violet in a, of my life as a rat is very different from the, the, the young people in Night, Sleep, Death in the Stars. She's just a different, she's a different person. I can imagine her. So I don't have any trouble doing that. We all know that there's a self much deeper than our personalities. And this self uh, emerges at night when we're asleep and it's a sort of unconscious, almost like an oceanic uh, uh, waves and, and waves of uh, a deeper personality. You might call it the soul, but the narrow personality in the daylight is just one little tiny fraction, I think. I have a follow-up question to uh, Fantasy Rail Productions. Uh, did you, do you find it harder to imagine or write a character who is closer to you, closer to your experience or easier. For instance, Jessalyn back in uh, forward in your, your, your new novel. Well, Jessalyn is very much my, uh, very much my own self. She is somebody who was, was a wife and a mother and she didn't get to do, she had wanted to be a teacher. She was interested in art and poetry also. But she, she fell in love and a man loved her very much. So she got married very young. So it's almost as if that could have been me if uh, circumstances in my life were different. It's very natural for me to write, to write about Jessalyn. But speaking generally, I think it's harder to do a self-portrait in art. It's much harder to do an objectively uh, convincing self-portrait than it would be to do a portrait of another person. Mm-hmm, 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 mm -hmm. writing poetry, if it's this person, it's not, it's not really you. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I think of method acting in a way as character writing. Uh, yeah. But, you know, there's some actors, Cary Grant, he was just Cary Grant, whoever else he was. So uh, he didn't have that approach. I see there is a question are there other recitations by Shopdahl available here on a YouTube channel? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I, I know that on the UC Berkeley website, there's something called the Holloway Poetry Readings, and that's a good place to find a lot of poetry readings. It's excellent. I heard John read on, on YouTube just today. He's wonderful. Oh, so I am on YouTube. Yeah. I, and your, hair is, and your hair is not changed. <laughs> I'm poet, poet here. I love it. It's great. Well, listen, if we don't have any more questions, I think we might uh, adjourn. Right. We've gone a little bit over, and I know people have to run to their next class. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that was, uh, that was then. Uh, so we can end with our cats. Yeah, let's... let's uh, 
Let's end with our cats. Uh, so Lilith, goodbye Lilith and goodbye owner of Lilith. Uh, Joy, so there's a stretch and a yawn. She was so thrilled. She was absolutely thrilled to the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, with that, I'm going to raise my, my hand and say, uh, say goodbye. Bye. Next time we'll do your poetry. Bye-bye.